Welcome, brother. Ben. Boy, that was way too much Masonic biography, wasn't it? Hey, I just want to say a, a kind word about my friend Ryan Flynn back here. He's not only letting me stay with him this weekend, but there's no doubt in my mind that 100 years from now, nobody's going to remember any of us except for Ryan. He's going to be famous. <laughs> so go buy his pictures. Uh, his art is uh, phenomenal. Uh, he's young. He's going to be super famous in masonry, and so uh, go buy some of that stuff up. How's that, Ryan? <laughs> Outstanding. Hey, look, these, uh, pay no attention to these slides other than they're just a, a, a bunch of pictures of us teaching this program, and it's called the Middle Chamber Program. It's a really groundbreaking thing that, a grand, that our Grand Lodge in North Carolina has, has started. It's a deep dive for Master Masons who volunteer to take the program on the philosophy and the spiritual aspects of Masonry. No Grand Lodge is, is diving into this in, in this sort of way, and I'm super proud of our leadership for letting us do it. Because there's non-Masons in the room, and I'm sure that all of you Masons know what I'm fixing to talk about intimately well, I'm going to do just a little bit of history and how we got to a place, how the craft found itself in a place where we don't talk about the philosophical and spiritual aspects that are laying right in front of us in our ritual. I don't know about down uh, up here, but down where I'm from, uh, that became a, a big faux pas. Nobody talked about that when I came into the lodge. Masonic membership, I just want to take a, a few minutes to do a little bit of background on this. We, we know if you looked at a, a chart of Masonic membership over its history, it looked kind of like one of them stock market charts that's up and down. Masonry's had its time of, of boom and of bust. A little closer in history to us, without going too far back, though, were the two world wars, and we know that after World War I, the guys came home and joined, and then we had the Depression, and membership was down, and after World War II, we had this huge, huge boom in membership. The war ended in 1945, and in 1946, uh, we just had, had just over three million Masons in the craft. By 1956, ten years later, th these are Masonic Service Association puts out uh, these membership numbers. You can go look at them. By 1956, ten years after the war ended, we had just over four million members, and we topped out at our highest number. That means in a decade, in ten years, we added a million men to Freemasonry. And it was fabulous. And... Everybody thought that that was going to last forever. The Freemasons thought we are the best thing in the world and these guys are going to never quit joining. But they did, didn't they? The boomers, the baby boomers, the, the kids of the greatest generation did not join. They were not joiners. Why? I don't know. Counterculture of the 60s? Maybe. Didn't want to be like their parents? Maybe. For whatever reason, they just didn't join in the numbers that that greatest generation did. And neither did any of the subsequent generations. They just didn't join like those guys from the greatest generation. Why did they join in such numbers? I don't know, but probably because they had just been through a very difficult time for the whole world. Tons of them had been in the military, and the ones that weren't in the military were, you know, doing it back home. It was a national cause. It was a world cause. And people learned to work together. They had to pull together during that time, and especially the guys you know, that were in the military. They just got used to working together and working in groups and being around each other. And when it was all over, they wanted to continue to keep those kinds of bonds. So those guys were joining, for the most part, for very fraternal reasons. They wanted to be around each other. They liked each other. So... As those numbers continued to grow, there was a side effect. There's always a side effect, right? And the side effect was that those guys were not joining for philosophical and spiritual reasons. The very essence of the things that our ritual is based on did not interest them. I'm not going to say every one of them. Sure, there were a few. But for the most part, that just wasn't why they were there. And that's okay. But as a result, as they became leaders in our lodge... They didn't know anything about the philosophical and spiritual aspects because it wasn't their interest. 
So then when you had a guy coming into the lodge that wanted to talk about those things, they didn't know what he was talking about. They didn't know the answers because they hadn't studied it. And so they told that guy what we always tell him, hey, you'll learn that when you're ready. When it's your time, join the Scottish Rite or the York Rite or something. You'll learn it there. But they just didn't know. It wasn't their fault. It's just the way that things developed. Transpired that by the time I came along, about a dozen years ago, that greatest generation were in their 70s and 80s. And then just a dozen years, just a dozen years ago, when I came in in North Carolina, you very much, by that time, that had morphed into you just do not talk about deeper aspects of the craft. They didn't want to hear it. And so they poo-pooed it, and they put those guys in a corner. They just put them in a closet. But everything changes. For everything, there is a season. And as those guys started to leave us, there's space for a new type of Freemasonry. And you're seeing that being manifested in guys like me coming around to talk about stuff like this. And that not just here. Everywhere you look in America, you're seeing that turn start to happen. In North Carolina, our Grand Lodge who are very progressive and forward-thinking folks, uh, felt this change. And when a knucklehead like me and some of my buddies came along and said, hey, we want to put together an official Grand Lodge sanctioned program to start teaching this stuff to our guys that are asking for it, they said, yeah, okay. I said, no, no, I, you know, I had this, I had a 157-page PowerPoint that I was going to pitch to them. And most worshipful brother, Doug Cottle's like, nah, just go teach it. It's good. We trust you. <laughs> Woo. Fortunately, one of the smarter things that we did was we went out and we asked uh, one of our Grand Line officers named Right Worshipful Brother Sean Bradshaw, who was at the time one of the Grand Wardens, probably Senior Grand Warden, Junior Grand Warden, uh, to be our patron. Uh, Sean Bradshaw is, is not only a very fine uh, lodge officer. He's going to be a fabulous grandmaster next year. He's our deputy this year. But he's also a very spiritually and philosophically minded guy, and he loves this stuff as much as we do, we the instructors. So together, uh, we cobbled together a program and called it the Middle Chamber. There's a longer history than all that, but I'm on a time limit here, so I'll get rid of that. So we spent a few nights at, uh, at the tractor shed cobbling out a uh, an outline of how we were going to teach this thing. We gathered together some really good instructors that had a base knowledge in both how to talk in front of people and how to teach uh, and had a background in this kind of stuff, this esoteric stuff. <laughs> it's a hard combination to find the right guys that have the dedication to pull it off and the right skill set, but we were just lucky. Was it, or maybe it was Providence that put that in our, uh, in our way. But we did. So we cobbled together this program. Now let me tell you what the program is. Here's some, here's some bones about it. It's a year-long dive into the allegory and the symbolism of the degrees. So in the first quarter, we teach several times across the state what we affectionately call the hook this is, this is what the instructors call it. It has an official name. It's like the introductory course or something. But we call it the hook because we're trying to hook guys. It's a three-hour lecture. So you go and you listen to a guy like me stand up in front of you for three hours giving you all this presentation on what it is we're going to teach you over the course of a year. We get pretty deep. And at the end of that three hours, the guys that have attended know one of two things. I've either just wasted three hours of my life and I can't wait to get home or they can't wait to give us their money to sign up for this course. There, there's no doubt, there's no middle ground with that. They're either for it or they're not. Now, everybody doesn't like this aspect of Freemasonry, and that's okay. There are lots of good things about Freemasonry other than the allegorical and, and symbolic parts of it that'll make you a good Freemason. You can be a great fundraiser. You can be a great fraternal guy. We need somebody to wash the dishes and, and mow the yard. We need everybody to make Freemasonry work. But for the guys that are coming into the craft, that are looking for this and have never been able to find it, 
except for with a few friends in whispered corners in their basement talking about these things. Now North Carolina has an option for them. So you go to the hook. You like the hook. You decide, yep, this is for me. I want to sign up. You call the grant, and we give a whole explanation of forms and stuff you've got to fill out. But more or less, you call up the Grand Lodge, who has somebody in charge of this. You give them 150 bucks, and they send you a student kit. The student kit has five books in it and a journal. And then you're signed up. And then you start getting correspondence from us. We give you homework assignments and, and reading assignments and, and generally stay in touch with you. And then in the second quarter, we teach an all-day-long class on the entered apprentice degree, on the symbols and the allegory and the philosophy. And you spend all day with us, and we use uh, lecture time, and we show movie clips and YouTube clips, and we do student interactive exercises all about the first degree. You get more reading assignments. You get more homework. We give you journaling things to do, and you come back in the third quarter, and we do an all-day class on the fellow craft degree. And then there's more homework and more assignments, and then you come back in the fourth quarter, and we do an all-day class on the Master of Mason degree. And this year, we're adding a capstone class, which is going to be a weekend long for the students that want to opt into this, a weekend uh, long uh, spiritual retreat where we're going to do cool things like meditation. And um, So that, that's essentially how the course works from an administrative standpoint. So what is it? I'm going to try and not get kicked out of masonry this weekend, so <laughs> I'm going to, being that they're non-masons watching this, um, I, I, I will attempt to give most of most of the uh, a cut down version of the hook without talking about things that will get me in trouble. But I know this: uh, when we stand a, a young man in the northeast corner of the lodge in North Carolina, we tell him that Freemasonry is a beautiful system of morality veiled in allegory and illustrated by symbols. Um, too often times prior to this, we did not ever get around to explaining to him what those symbols stood for or what those allegories meant. For me, in North Carolina, we return a catechism. I guess some of y'all do various degrees of this, but ours is pretty long. It's a pretty big deal. You're assigned a coach after you go through the entered apprentice degree, and you and your coach start getting together. So I'm getting together with my coach. I'm going over to his house a couple times a week, and I remember about the third or fourth session, I asked my coach, hey, coach, when are we going to get to the, uh, the deeper parts of this? What are you talking about, Ben? See, I joined Masonry because I'd read Dan Brown's book, The Da Vinci Code, and I knew that you guys had... <laughs> the Holy Grail or the Ark of the Covenant or something in the basement of the Little Lodge in Mount Gilead where I joined. <laughs> but because of that, I was listening to that part when they told me that it was veiled in allegory and illustrated by symbols. I knew that because I'd read down Brown's book, right? So <clears throat> I was waiting for the allegory to be explained and the symbols to be given life. And, you know, we're learning these words, and, and they're good, but when I asked my coach, He's like, what are you talking about, Ben? I said, you know, the deeper stuff. That's what we're doing, Ben. That's what we're doing. And I thought, ah, there's got to be more to it than that. So I asked the, some of the old guys in the lodge, and I asked the master of the lodge, and you know, I figured out pretty quick that all those guys didn't really know. They didn't know, but it wasn't their fault because their coach hadn't told them, and it wasn't his fault because their coach hadn't told him. <laughs> Hopefully, at some point in the past, when a young guy would come along that was interested in those things and were asking those questions, there would be that old guy in the lodge that would come up to him and put his arm around him and say, hey, come here, kid. Let's have a talk. Here, read this book. Meet this guy. But somehow we had lost that. And I almost gave up on it because that's what I was looking for. I didn't care anything about the fraternal aspect. I mean, I did in a way, but that isn't what I was looking for. I was looking for the deeper stuff. I wanted the Dan Brown stuff. And I thought for a while maybe they didn't have it. But my intuition told me that it was there, that I just had to keep looking. So I joined the York Rite, and I joined the Scottish Rite, and I joined all of the things. In the southern jurisdiction, the Scottish Rite has a pretty good program to, to explain things, but they didn't when I came along. So um, I didn't really find what I was looking for there either. But slowly, over time, with patience and perseverance, I started to meet the right people. The internet helped a lot. started to meet some folks. I started to find the right books. 
And slowly I cobbled together in my mind kind of where we were going with this thing. And then over the years, that morphed into me knowing just enough about it to be dangerous enough to uh, actually try to, to, to share some of it with some, with some other folks. One of the things that I did right off the bat was I'm a voracious reader, and so I started reading a, just a, every book I could get my hands on. And one of the first books that I read was a book called The Craft and the Cross by Chris McClintock. Anybody read this book? Yep, so it's uh, generally uh, about the progression of the equinoxes and how masonry and the way that we stand and the gestures that we do, the signs and the way we put our feet has a lot to do with uh, the stars when you lined up when you're standing somewhere south of Edinburgh, Scotland, and it made perfect sense. And I thought, I have, I have Eureka, I have found it. I have found the secrets of masonry. I found what this is all about. And then I went on and I read another book called uh, Born in Blood by John Robinson. Everybody's read this one, right? Yep. So it's English Peasant Revolt and Templars, and I thought, ah, Chris was obviously wrong. Now I know what Freemasonry is. It's, we're all Templars. <laughs> then I read this book by Chris Knight and Robert Lomas about this Egyptian pharaoh from the Lower Kingdom. They dug up, and he had a hole in his head, and they thought he was Hiram Abiff, and it was about then, and it made perfect sense. It made perfect sense. And it was about then that I figured out that masonry wasn't one thing. It's a lot of things. Ryan alluded to it in his earlier presentation. The point of all that, fellas, is that nobody has custodianship of universal truth or of the truth of Freemasonry. It's really a lot of things. So if any dude stands up here and tells you that Freemasonry is all from one aspect, uh, that's, that's not correct. Do your, own, do your own research and make your own decisions. And we beat this drum all of the time in the middle chamber. We teach middle chamber from a certain philosophy. We're not saying that this is the only way to look at your Freemasonry. Not the only way to look at your Freemasonry, but this is the angle that we're teaching this class from. And this is from a certain set of Masonic philosophers that all generally come at it from the same angle. The books that we send them, the five textbooks, are written by these philosophers, and we easily could have come up with, with 25 or 30 books easy enough, but we couldn't afford them. The students pay $150 for this student packet, and we didn't want to get the price much up over the, that. So the guys that wrote the books, though, we use uh, The Meaning of Masonry by Walter Leslie Wilmshurst, great primer for anybody. Uh, George Steinsmetz has a book called Freemasonry is, uh, is Hidden Meaning. We use that book. Uh, we use Kirk McNulty's The Way of the Craftsman. Uh, we use Chuck Dunning's uh, Contemplative Masonry, and we, this year we're using Rob Hurd's Initiatic uh, uh, Experience. So these guys all come at this from kind of a Neoplatonic, Kabbalistic uh, viewpoint. I encourage you to read all of those books uh, and, and just see the angle they're coming from. Again, there were more books that we could have used. We're not married specifically to those guys, but we are married specifically to that way of teaching this class. So whenever the guys in the class start saying, well, what about this angle or what about that angle? Yeah, it can be all that. I'm just telling you how we're teaching it. So let's talk a little bit about the degrees. Everything in the first degree, and, and all of this comes from the teaching of the guys that I was just telling you for the most part. Everything in the first degree, from the, from the divestiture to the last working tool, keeping me out of trouble, <laughs> is about the material, physical world and your interaction with it and how you interact with the physical world. And there's some big takeaways that we want you to come away with. One of the big takeaways is materialism and the idea of being married to our stuff. One is the idea of the false self or the ego and how we interact with the world, and another is the practicing of the virtues. We go into extreme depth in this in the class. We spend all day talking about it. We give tons of reading assignments about it. In the three-hour hook, we go much longer into it, but in the essence of time, just know that your attachment to your stuff will eat up your life if you let it. Anybody have kids or grandkids or nephews or nieces that play ball? When you play ball, that comes to dominate your life. When I was a kid, I played I played Little League Baseball, and it wasn't very good, but I hopped on my bicycle and I went to practice. Parents didn't come to practice. 
and they ain't even come to all the games. This was in the 70s. You know, they weren't expected to. I mean, we were in, you know, I was in fifth grade, and they didn't come to all the games even. But nowadays, you got to come, and you got to go to every practice, and you got to go to every game. And God forbid your kids are any good and get on a travel team, because then you got to track up and down the East Coast, and it just comes to dominate your life. Golf, bass fishing, turkey hunting. I'm from North Carolina. I don't know what y'all do up here. <laughs> Deer hunting, turkey hunting, I mean, all these things will dominate your life. Freemasonry will take over and dominate your whole life if you let it. And if you're attached to that stuff, it's bad enough you got to have a job and a house and a car and insurance and cable TV and Internet. So you're already married to your job, but when you start to tack all these other superfluous stuff onto it, you don't have time to work on yourself or the more important things that we're going to teach you in the second degree and the third degree. The false self or the ego is how we interact with other people. These days, ego, if you talk about ego, you, talk, you think about a big feeling in somebody. That's kind of the connotation that, that has now. But we're talking about in the, in the idea of the false self. Here's an example. I own a mechanical contracting company. It's commercial air conditioning. And uh, I, I'm sitting on 28 employees right now. And every morning I go into work, and between 7 and 7.30, we have meetings with our supervisory staff. And when we do that, I'm the boss. There is no doubt who's in charge when I'm there. I've, I've got my boss face on. And we're talking about goals that we're going to accomplish that day and things that we didn't do the day before. And the guy that wrecked the truck or said something stupid to one of my customers. And I'm, you know, I'm doing boss things. I'm playing the boss role. Another thing I do for our company is I do s most of our larger commercial sales. So it's not unusual that later in the day, about 10 o'clock in the morning, 11 o'clock in the morning, I'm sitting in some guy's office trying to sell him tens of thousands of dollars worth of air conditioning, and I'm not talking to him in the same mode that I was talking to my employees that morning that had just done something stupid the day before. I'm wearing my salesman mask, right? And hopefully, at the end of the day, when I go home, I can leave all that in my pickup truck, and I can go home and just be daddy and husband. But even that's not the real me sometimes because we play different roles in that. Sometimes I, as daddy, I have to be disciplinary daddy. Something went wrong at school. i got to be the bad guy. Sometimes I'm encouraging daddy. Sometimes I'm, you know, we're out riding motorcycles and, and, and can-ams. My daughter's got a dirt bike, and I'm fun daddy, right? But so you play different roles. You certainly play them with your spouse also. And you have to do that to get along in the world, especially if you're going to be effective in the world. We all know somebody says, oh, that guy, he's never the same. He doesn't care where he is. He's the same all the time. Eh, may, that, that's probably not a true statement, but maybe so. But if you're going to really be effective in the world, you have to ma wear these different masks, but you have to manage them. Know what they are. Just don't make sure that they don't dominate your life and take over your life and that you don't become one of those things that you're pretending to be. Because, fellas, there's a real you down in there somewhere. And getting to that is what masonry is trying to teach you, to uncover that real you, to unpack all of the layers, past, boss, father, husband, all of that to get down to the real you. The last thing and the big takeaway that we try to teach you in the interdependence degree is the virtues. So, when I first, when we've even first started teaching this course, I thought the virtues were about learning to be a good person and make good decisions. But I've come to believe that it's so much more than that. I'm going to touch on this when we get to the third degree again in just a little bit. But in order to become the virtues, you have to first understand them and you have to practice them. They're vitally important. Uh, from from a you know Plato talked about this. Uh, the Neoplatonists uh, built whole systems around it. So it comes down to us, and I, it, it is vitally important to where we're going in the third degree. I'm running short on time here. So the second degree, if the first degree is all about materialism and and the false self and the virtues, the the second degree is all about the mind stuff, the psychical part of man, to use a Wilmshurst term. 
It's all of this stuff that goes on in your mind and all of your own hang-ups. It's your intellect and your personality typology. It's your fears. It's your pride. It's, it's all of the parts of you uh, that are the mind things. And so this degree, especially in the staircase lecture, talks about this a lot. We teach you to understand sacred geometry that Ryan was talking about a little bit earlier. Uh, this is uh, the meaning of the, uh, of the, of the columns. Uh, it teaches you about the five senses of human nature and specifically that you understand the world using those five senses of human nature, but there's so much more. There's numberless worlds around us, right? All framed by the same divine artist. What does that mean? It means there are things that you aren't aware of yet, but they're there. You aren't aware of them because you haven't got unpacked them yet. You haven't got that deep down inside of yourself. The trivium and quadrivium of the ancient world uh, is mirrored in the seven liberal arts and sciences. And back in the day, in North Carolina, you simple language fellas, if you, if you had mastered the trivium and quadrivium of those art, uh, arts and sciences, you, were, you had a master's degree, a doctorate's degree. You were as smart a fellow as there was. You knew all the stuff, and it's important to us. It's important because when we come in the door on that second degree, uh, we're met with the duality. We're met with those two columns that stand right in front of us. Masonry is chock full of dualities and trinities. Dualities and trinities. Think about all the dualities in the lodge, the black and white pavement, the sun and the moon. You can go on and on with this. Everywhere you look in Freemasonry, you see dualities. What that's trying to teach us is that we live in a dual world. Scientifically, uh, we spend a lot of time in the class talking about uh, the idea of physical things that are dual, hot and cold, uh, you know, fast and slow, you know, uh, high pressure and low pressure. So we do all these student exercises to make them understand that there's duality. I'm an air conditioned man. I'm all about making hot and cold a trinity. I'm about getting people in the right balance so that they're happy. Right. So we try to do that in the physical world, but we also are faced with other dualities. We have spiritual dualities. We have social dualities. And so our goal is to find a place to come down in the middle of those. In the essence of time, I'm going to let that go, but it's, it's, uh, it's vitally important to understand that we're, all we're, always, we're always trying to be that third leg of that triangle to make a, to make a trinity and c trying to find out where to come down on all these issues uh, are made easier by having knowledge, and it's the knowledge of the, um, uh, of the seven liberal arts and sciences. We're going to press on. So in that degree, in that staircase lecture, there's a point where you're spiraling up those stairs and you come to a block and there's somebody there and you have to convince that, that warden that it's okay for you to pass, that you've learned all the lessons of the first degree. Now, always, we just pass right on, right? I mean, we, we, we do the things, uh, we continue on with that degree. But think about what that's saying to you. That's about somebody standing there saying, an aspect of you saying to you, if you aren't ready, then you don't need to go on to try to learn the lessons that, uh, that are awaiting you on the other side of this door. We just pass them on anyway. But I'm not complaining about this, but Freemasonry is what it is, and we try to get guys through pretty quickly here in America. The goal is to see how quick we can get them through so we can get them a dues card, right? But then we're encouraging them in this middle chamber program to go back and revisit those lessons and learn them before they go on to the next lesson. Anyway, so there's a river, river in Western uh, mystery, uh, rivers and waters and oceans and seas are always uh, uh, s spiritual or sometimes emotional um, aspects, and we're always crossing over. Any time in Western mystery, think about your Bible lessons, uh, when something really uh, profound is about, about to happen, a lot of times we're crossing over a body of water, uh, we do that, there's one more door to go into, and then we go into our middle chamber, into our middle chamber. Always, always in Freemasonry, always. You are the temple and you are the lodge. Allegorically, symbolically, 
the lodge is you. The lodge is you. It represents you. Kirk McNulty in his book assigns aspects of you to each of the officers. The columns are your columns. The globes are your globes. The middle chamber is your middle chamber. It's deep inside of you. It's that place uh, that Colonel Jessup says in A Few Good Men that you don't talk about at parties. It's that part deep down inside of you that you're going to unpack as you start to get working towards your Ungian shadow issues. So when you can start to understand the dualities of the world and start to transcend them through your knowledge and your judgment and the use of the virtues, then you can start to get deeper and deeper down inside of yourself and get past all the, uh, the, the superfluous aspects of yourself and you get into that middle chamber in that deep part. It's a spiritual place. And it's where Freemasonry wants you to go. Once you find yourself in that place, we're going to skip right ahead to the Hiram legend. I've got to be really careful here, fellas. But think about all the things that you've done so far in your journey in masonry. You've learned not to be tied to all the material things of the world. You've learned to manage your false selves and egos and not let them master you. You've learned to... To, to how to live with the virtues and how to pra better practice the virtues. You've learned about sacred geometry and, the, and, and that the world is a universe is a bigger place than you think it is. You've learned the twi trivium and quadrivium uh, of the ancient world, and now you find yourself deep within yourself with all of this knowledge. And what are we going to find when we get there? Hopefully we're going to find that real you that we were looking for. What is that real you that we were looking for? You know it when you see it. So we start this degree. Strangely enough, in our ritual, I don't know about y'all's, one of the chairs is empty. And one of the, the jewels of that officer is hung on the candidate's neck, right? It's because he's not in balance. So if, the, if, if we know that the worshipful master always represents, this is all the philosophers, from all the philosophers that we use their books, if he represents the spiritual aspect of you and the senior warden represents the psychological aspect of you, then the junior warden represents all of those things put together in, the, in just the right amounts. And when you take those dualities of spirituality and your own mental capabilities and you put them together in just the right proportions, in just the right cake mix, then you're going to get a new you. So we take that guy, we hang, we, he's out of balance because that chair is empty. He goes um, and up. Be careful, Ben. <laughs> so he's told, so this candidate is told uh, that he thinks that he's a master mason. He's got a, at this point, he's, you know, he's got his dues card. He thinks he's done. We tell him that there's more trepidation to come, and it is a very difficult road for him to travel, right? There are, there are some tough times ahead for him. And they're not physical tough times. They're, they're spiritual tough times. They're psychological tough times. You're getting down to the real depths of your own soul, and it's difficult. We ask God to help us on that journey, right? We, have, we, we, we pray that we're going to be okay. And then we go into acting the role of the part of us of, of that warden that uh, is the part of us that's the complete put-together man. And for a time, that dude, that aspect of you that is missing now from all of us in this room, me included, is kind of laid waste and destroyed, right? He's losing. He's losing the battle of being a human, of being a complete human, a complete put-together human. He's been beaten down by life. All of the bad parts of him are winning. And he's buried right here in his, own, in his own temple, in his own lodge. He's in here, but he's not put together right. But fortunately, spirit, the spiritual aspect of yourself, calls together some of the better angels of your nature, to borrow a phrase from Lincoln and Michael Holleran, and goes on a quest, on a hero's journey, to try and put you back together. And they're successful. They find you. Through, f through faith, they find you on a hill 
where spiritual things happen. Think about your Bible and Western mystery and all the things that happen on mountains or hills. And there you find out that you can be raised to a new standard of, of you, the very best you that could ever be put together in all the right aspects. You start to not just live the virtues, not just practice the virtues, but you come to embody the virtues. When you can become, when there is a becoming, a quickening, when you actually become that best you that you can possibly be, then you're raised to a whole new standard. Maurice Nicole says that there, every man has a new man within him. We just have to find it and raise ourselves to that standard. Ryan used the, uh, the Ashlers a little while ago, that rough Ashler becoming that perfect Ashler. But the secret is that perfect Ashler is in you right now. It's in every one of us. You've just got to free it up, right, Ryan? So with the help of the better aspects of you, you do that. And then the clouds part and the angels sing and you become a new man. All of this we teach over the course of a year. We talk a ton about the specific symbols and the specific allegories and what they mean from the aspect of these philosophers. And all the students love it. And all the instructors love it. And we are very proud of it here in North Carolina. We were fortunate enough to be asked to go to Illinois during the polar vortex. Thank you very much, RJ. <laughs> canceled canceled all, all our flights. We had to uh, rent a car and drive through it. Anyway, uh, we went and taught their education committee, and they are actively working on putting together a version uh, of, of this program. They'll probably call it something different. It'll no doubt look somewhat different than ours does. But, uh, but they're doing that. Right Worshipful Brother Sean Bradshaw, who I told you was our patron, our Grand Lodge uh, representative, our Deputy Grand Master that's going to be Grand Master next year and that is at every session and is a fabulous instructor himself. Um, I'm not speaking for him. Well, yeah, I am. He, he wants to see this proliferate as much as we instructors do. So we're, North Carolina is open for business. If your education committee or your, it has to be a, a grand, grand Lodges talk to Grand Lodges. Ben doesn't speak for any Grand Lodge. But our Grand Lodge officer, Sean Bradshaw, who's in charge of this program, we'd like to speak to your Grand Lodge officer about coming to teach uh, this program to your education committee with an eye towards uh, your grand jurisdiction potentially putting together something like this. It's time, brothers. It's time. It's time in the craft for a change. We talked about the numbers at the very beginning of this program. I don't know what Freemasonry is going to look like when we finally hit the bottom on numbers. We're going to drop below a million men. Uh, the two, uh, the MSA doesn't have their 2018 numbers up yet, but in 18 or 19, unless something miraculous happens, we're going below a million men. Remember I told you we had 4 million in 1956? We're going below a million men of Freemasonry according to those numbers either in 18 or 19. And where is it going to bottom out? I don't know. Different grand jurisdictions are taking different ways of looking at this. Nobody's got the wrong answer. We just don't know what the right answer is. It, all I can tell you is uh, instead of trying to get more numbers in North Carolina, uh, our guys, my observation of, of our grands is that they, do, they don't care where the numbers bottom out. They just want good men. So we're trying to focus on the quality of the folks. They think that the money will come if, uh, if the guys are in it for the right reasons, if they're all bought into to what Freemasonry is. I think they're right, but part of we don't know what it's going to look like when it finally bottoms out. But I can't help but think that this is going to be an important part of it. Getting back to a, uh, what we're supposed to do, the, the more uh, spiritual and philosophical stuff is going to make for a richer and thicker gravy. That's what we use in North Carolina is a lot of gravy. You start with a roux, right? <laughs> and guys are just looking for this deeper stuff, and so we're going to provide it for them. And I encourage all of you to think about doing the same thing. I'd like to thank Ezekiel Bates Lodge for uh, asking me to come up here and speak. I'm honored to do it right behind Ryan, and, and, um, and I'll take a few questions. I have eight minutes. <laughs>